I just wanted to talk about this article, you know, what it says and what it doesn't say and what we can do about it if we should be worrying about it. Or Welcome what? back to the Wandering Star Farmhouse. Here I make videos about gardening, cooking from scratch, and kind of just living a homemade life. And I'm glad you're here. Today I wanted to talk about this article that has been kind of making the rounds about the carbon footprint of the backyard garden. I kind of put off making this video because I wanted Jeremy, my resident PhD, to maybe do this video with me, but somebody's got to pay the bills around here. So he's at work, he couldn't make it. Basically what this research showed was that the vegetables produced through urban agriculture have a carbon footprint six times higher than conventionally produced agriculture. I did go ahead and look up the actual publication of this research to go over the methodology and look at some different things, but let's just take it at face value. Let's say that this is 100% accurate. My first response to this was, yeah, of course it is. We all know that the reason that we have acres and hundreds and, and thousands of acres of monoculture here in the United States is because this monoculture of a large farm is a highly efficient way of producing food. The main factors that the researchers identified as being the things that make a greater footprint for the home garden was the infrastructure, the supplies, and irrigation. So one of the things they're talking about is like the construction materials for making raised beds, for example, or a little greenhouse or a garden shed that holds all your tools. One of my concerns about this line of thinking is just kind of wondering how does this compare someone who is practicing urban agriculture or backyard gardening, how does this level of inputs compare to just your average person who lives in a suburban neighborhood? Okay, so I moved from a suburban neighborhood to this location and nearly every backyard down our street had a shed. That's not something that is, you know, uniquely something that gardeners do, right? Now, what about the idea of raised beds? There are plenty of people who do a lot of hardscaping in their just general landscaping in their yard. I'm not sure that the inputs can be attributed solely to the growing of the food. Someone, if they didn't have raised beds for a garden, for a vegetable garden, they may have raised edges to their flower garden. Then they also talked about, in terms of the supplies, they talked about compost, fertilizer, and gas. And there again, I just would like to see a comparison between your normal suburban backyard and between one that is doing urban agriculture because compost, fertilizer, and gasoline all sound to me like things that most people use just to maintain their lawn every year. So I'm a little bit concerned that um, these are being attributed solely to the growing of the food when they actually would are just pretty ubiquitous pretty mainstream, pretty common to be found in the maintenance of a suburban piece of property, whether it's practicing urban or agriculture or whether it is not. So one thing that they talked about considering from the research was trying to extend the life of your infrastructure. And I don't think that there's anybody that puts time and money and effort into their infrastructure that is happy to just see it go to waste. So I think we all like really do a pretty good job of trying to preserve our in infrastructure. But you know, there's different steps that we can take to try and mitigate some of these inputs that are required for our garden. A lot of people these days have moved to market style gardening where you're kind of mounding raised mounds on the ground. That's kind of what we're doing here where I haven't built a bunch of beds here like I did at my last house like uh, with wood, but I still anticipate some amount of those hardscapes in my ultimate plans of what I'm doing here. Another growing trend in the home gardening is soil blocking. And that's something that I'm actually trying out for the first time this year. I bought a soil blocker and I just really liked this idea because I do reuse my plastic pots year after year, but eventually they break down. They're not meant to last indefinitely. So with a soil blocker, you're able to make blocks of soil to start your seeds in instead of using the little plastic pots. So that's one, one thing that I'm doing on my garden to try and limit the number of inputs that are coming in. 
Another thing I think there is to think about is a lot of people consider gardening like a hobby of theirs, right? And so if you were to compare urban agriculture as a hobby and take that and compare that to some other common hobbies, what would the difference in carbon output be for those different hobbies? If you think about like dirt biking or jeeping or trucking or RVing, you know, those are definitely ones, you know, there's a lot of gasoline involved with those ones. But like I say, even looking at things like golfing, um, how does it compare to the carbon footprint of going golfing and having a golf course maintained? Um, what about the supplies purchased for any types of other, you know, woodworking or crafting? Like I said, I do think it's a little bit muddied here about how much of this can be just how much of the carbon footprint of the activity can be just placed solely on the food as opposed to just on human life in general, people seeking a, a life that is uh, fulfilling. And that was one of the things that the researchers said that they wanted to encourage in, in, in order to more effectively use the carbon footprint of the, the garden is to make the garden a gathering place, make it a community spot. Obviously, there are a lot of other benefits to gardening besides just the vegetables. So there is the health benefit. Obviously, if we all sat indoors and watched TV as our only hobby, that would probably be a much lower carbon footprint depending on how much air conditioning we were using. But going outside is good for our bodies. It is good for our minds, for our mental health. Spending time outside is good for our mental health. And as they pointed out, it can be good for community building as well. The other benefits when you're comparing the monoculture of conventional agriculture to a, an urban garden, there is a big difference in biodiversity. So some people might argue that monocultures and the intense inputs and fertilizers and pesticides that go into conventional agriculture have many negative effects that can't be measured on the scale of carbon. I follow a number of different gardeners who their yards are classified as like wildlife refuges or monarch way stations or, you know, nature preserves or whatever. You can get these different kind of um, home scale certifications done of your own space where when people are pursuing that, they are helping the environment in really positive ways. And I think that gardening, that urban agriculture encourages the feelings of stewardship for the land and that overall, those are going to improve people's, uh, you know, carbon footprint on the land, as they say. I, I'm not super concerned with the numbers. Um, I, I don't get super caught up on my kids' grades at school either. It's, it's, it's a number. It's a way of measuring something. But I am a concerned parent. I talk to my kids. Is your homework done? How's it going? What are you working on at school right now? And to me, those are some of the measures that I find a little more just in line with what I am trying to do with my kids than the, the one number at the end of the nine week period. I want to push back just a little bit more on the methodology as well. My husband, like I said, went through a PhD program and I recognize that there's limitations. There's only so much you can do. These issues are so big. You have to focus down to a, a small enough piece to be manageable and find something particular that you can study and, and then try and learn from that. This study mostly involved researching the urban agriculture sites. And for the comparison to conventional agriculture, they just used some established numbers. And they say that transportation was included in these numbers. I'm just not 100% convinced that there's that big of a difference when, when transportation is included. And that may have to do with the fact that this study studied a number of European countries and the United States. And I would imagine that the United States numbers are much different from Europe. Um, Europe is just a lot more compact. And I think there's just a lot more trucking that goes on in the United States that maybe the numbers there are, are a little bit off. But beyond transportation, I'm curious about if packaging was included because packaging is another highly carbon intensive uh, aspect of food, commercial food production that in some instances is non-existent for the home garden. In some instances it is. If you're preserving things for later, you do end up using some packaging. Although glass canning jars obviously can be used 
over and over for a long period of time and have, have just a, a much more limited amount of waste there. The other thing that they did say that they considered in this study was, was in terms of people driving to the grocery store, they decided to say, well, that just evens out with driving to the community garden. There's only so much detail you can go into, but obviously in my case, I don't drive to a community garden. My garden's in my backyard. So gas that I am saving by not going to the grocery store as often to get food, that should count for something. The other thing is refrigeration. So I assume, like I say, in these numbers that they used were supposed to be all inclusive. These items are refrigerated usually on site until they are packaged and then shipped and they're often refrigerated during shipping and then they're refrigerated at the grocery store and then they are refrigerated in your home until you eat them. If I have green peppers growing in the backyard, green peppers are one of those ones that can be picked at any stage of ripeness. They, there's just a long period of time when you can pick green peppers and they're good and you know, they're good. So green peppers is one of those things where I, I would not be storing my green peppers in the refrigerator. My green peppers are in the backyard and I go and pick one when I want one and chop it up and use it. So I never at any point need to refrigerate the, that kind of produce that I'm making at home. So that's just another one of my points where uh, uh, of you know, concern about, I'm not sure that this was fully taken into consideration in terms of this study. But when it comes right down to it, like I say, let's just assume that it's all, it's 100% correct, that the carbon footprint of homegrown vegetables is way higher than, than uh, conventionally grown produce. When it comes right down to it, I just don't care. I, I don't actually think that a food system where our food is trucked on average 1500 miles to get to its final destination, the large parts of our country provide all the food for the other parts of the country, that I as an individual have to be wholly reliant on other people to feed my children. I'm just not interested in that. That doesn't seem like a good system to me. I don't want to be completely helpless in providing for my children. It kind of makes you wonder about what's going on here. I don't think that the, the research itself is making all the insinuations that the articles that are covering the research results are. Does that make sense? I think that some of the articles that are writing up about the results of the research are a little more concerning than the actual research itself. It's a fact of the news media industry that kind of salacious or shocking headlines that sell more news. And so part of it I think is, well, we're gonna, you know, say the shocking part of this, or we're gonna make shocking conclu conclusions from this research. But uh, there is a little part of me too that just that just feels a little bit creeped out by this kind of conversation going on in our country. It seems like in today's world that people want easy, quick answers. They want scapegoats. They want to be able to point to something and say, that's the problem and let's get rid of it. So what, do I think they're gonna come for our gardens and tell us that we're not allowed to grow vegetables in the backyard? I mean, I would say no, but I have experience with things like uh, trying to get backyard chickens legalized in our town and listening to different people's arguments and ultimately having the city council refuse to even let us officially bring our amendment to receive an official vote and official hearing. It felt a whole lot like there was some craziness going on. And this was even in the early days of COVID when there literally were egg shortages and times when I went to the grocery store and there was no eggs available at the grocery store. I saying a lot of stuff that kind of defies logic and defies common sense. And some people like for things to be tied up in a neat, pretty package. All of the food comes on this truck and goes on the shelves and we take it home. That's fine for you. But the empowerment that comes from being able to provide something for yourself, the increase in your self-worth as a human being just can't be measured. Gardening is good for the soul. Tending to your own property fosters environmental stewardship. Grow a garden. It's good for you. It's good for the planet. It may not have a lower carbon footprint than conventionally grown agriculture, but it's good for the planet. I have no doubt. So join me this year. The 2024 gardening season is beginning. I've got little seeds starting to pop up next to my kitchen window, and there's a lot of joy and fulfillment 
and food that we'll have coming in this year. See you on the next video.